Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson, and today I'm going to be looking at Shake That City. Now the theme of this one is a little on the sparse side. You're designing a city based on patterns coming out of a shaker device, and the buildings you're replacing are what I kind of come to expect from this type of game. You know, this tile scores being next to these, or this one doesn't score if it's adjacent to this type of tile. Stuff we've seen before. But what sets this game apart is the shaker device. It's going to be a device for laying out nine random cubes in a square. You need to pick a single color of cube from those random nine cubes and place your tiles on the, your board that match that pattern of those cubes. Now, the main reason why I got this game is honestly for the shaker. I like the idea for randomization, and I hope it adds something to the game as the rest of the game sounds like tile placement games we've seen before. So, will this game shake up the gaming world, or will it just fall to pieces? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and we'll come back with my final thoughts on Shake That City. So here is Shake That City set up for three players. All the building tiles go into the center of the table, and each player gets a two-sided player board. The first player shuffles up their bonus tiles and places them around the north and west of their board. All the other players do the same, keeping the same cardinal directions as the first player. All the cubes are placed in the shaker, and the round tracker and marker are placed off to one side. Now the game is played over 12 rounds, and each round the first player will shake up the shaker and drop out 9 cubes. Colors are chosen and the corresponding building tiles are placed onto your player board. At the end of 12 rounds, the bonus tiles can score you points along with the placement of the building tiles, and the player with the most points is the winner. A round plays out like this. The active player takes the shaker and gives it a shake, then presses the button to release 9 cubes. Then the active player will choose one color set of cubes. All other players will then pick a different color set. All non-active players can pick the same color or different colors, they just cannot pick the same color as the current active player. All players then take their corresponding colored building tiles and add them to their board. Now they must stay in the exact orientation as shown in the cubes. All building tiles must be placed. The pattern of the tiles must match exactly to the corresponding cubes. You cannot flip, rotate, or reconfigure them in any way. If there's no building color in the pattern of cubes that will fit your board, you're not going to be placing any tiles that turn. When all players have placed their building tiles, advance the round marker, pass the cube shaker to the next player. Now all rounds work the same, except for the last three rounds. In these three rounds, all players are able to freely choose a color to build. They are not blocked by whatever the active player chooses. After the 15th round, the game ends and we go to scoring. First, all players evaluate their bonus tiles. Now each bonus tile has two parts. If either side is complete, you flip the tile over and get the three points. The square bonus tiles all have a if this row is completely filled with tiles on the other side and another side. There are five tiles that require four buildings of the same matching color in that row and one that must have four different colors in a row. The corner bonus tiles is if you have at least two of every building in your board. Once the bonus tiles have been flipped to their point side, if you've achieved them, you move on to building scoring. The grey buildings are roads, and they score only if they're connected to the edge of the board. Score one point per road connected to the edge. The green parks score up to two points. They score one point if it's adjacent to any number of factories, which are black tiles, and one point if it's next to any number of home tiles, which are the red ones. The black factories score up to two points as well. They score one point for being next to any other factories, and one point for being adjacent to any number of roads. The blue shops will only score if they are connected to the edge of the board, either by being adjacent to the edge of the board, or being connected by a row to the edge of the board. If they are connected to the edge, the score of points for the zone that is in, either 1, 2, or 3 points. And finally, the red homes. Any group of homes will score 2 points regardless of how large the group is. But if any home or group of homes is next to a factory, that group is going to score 0 points instead. Once you've calculated everybody's score, the player with the most points is the winner. Now let's get back to see what I thought about Shake That City. So on to theme and components. The theme of this one, as I said in the intro, is very sparse. But what there is actually does make some thematic sense. You know, houses not wanting to be next to factories? Makes sense. Shops being accessible by roads? Again, it just makes sense. Now, the randomization of the shaker makes no sense, but the shaker is definitely fun. For the components, the cargo components are pretty standard. The player boards are double-sided, and there is slight different uh, layouts on each side. There is a kind of a scoring aid, which shows you also how many cubes there are in the little shaker box, which I didn't find as useful as I had hoped for. But the big thing for the components is the shaker box. Does it work? I found it works about 85-90% of the times. 
Sometimes it left an extra cube though, but most of the time you can just correct it by returning the obvious cube back into the little slot here. If it's not obvious, it's fast enough to just dump all the cubes back in and reselect. It does a very good job of clearly delineating the cube, so there's never any question of which cube is where. So definitely, thumbs up for this device, and it even comes with a little less extra elastic bands in the box. On to the gameplay. It's pretty straightforward. Reveal cubes, pick a color, place your tiles. But I think that kind of oversimplifies the game a little bit. There's actually some really good decisions to be made on every player's turn. Because the scoring is not straightforward and offers some different challenges. For example, it is more efficient to have multiple single houses than trying to get a large group of them. And making sure that none of them are next to factories is important. Getting shops early on into the three-point section makes sense, but will you be able to get the roads to connect them to the edges? I also like that everyone is essentially working with the same board. Having all the boards reflect the first player's orientation means that you have the same layout and same chances. I also really like that you have to match the exact pattern of the color cubes you took. There's no rotation, mirroring, or anything else. It definitely helps reduce some of the analysis paralysis that can start to creep into this game. You still have multiple options of where to place your tiles on the board, so having them stay in the same orientation just kind of reduces those options a bit, which definitely makes it more approachable. That being said, there is a family variant in the box where you can just play with having the large uh, tiles, bonus tiles around your board to score points, which I do think is a good way to introduce the game or play with the family. The scoring of the tiles is not exactly straightforward. The capping out of each tile to a certain victory points isn't always obvious. For example, factories. If it's adjacent to four factories, it's still only worth one point. To score the two points, it has to be adjacent to a factory and a road. It doesn't matter how many of each one. So one road and one factory will score the base factory the same number of points as one road and three factories. It's nothing difficult, but based on previous games, people tend to want to want to build up you know big sets of things. And I do like that there are two sides to this board. You know, the second side being more of a, a beach scene, it has slight changes to the scoring, and it also limits of how you can get to the outside area. There's also a variant in the box called the construction variant, which slightly changes up some of the gameplay as well. Nothing major. But definitely, once you play the game a few times, you'll want a little addition to the game. So, would I recommend it? I think I would. The base game is not complex, but still gives you something to think about on your turn. And the shaker, it does exactly what you want it to do. I really like the shaker element. It was a neat way to randomize the cubes. I also like the scoring of the buildings. Planning out how to maximize your points was a fun puzzle, and that's really what this game is more of. It's more of a puzzle. I thought the idea of not being able to flip, rotate, etc. the tiles was a good idea to help keep the game moving. I also liked that with the length of the game. Even with four players, the game lasts about 30 minutes. And it didn't outstay its welcome. Everyone wanted a chance to use the shaker. On the con side though, I do worry about the longevity of the game. There is slight variance in the box, but really not enough to really change up the gameplay from game to game. I wish there were alternate scoring for the buildings that you can kind of mix and match and make every game different scoring. Overall though, I'm going to give this game a 7.5 out of 10 and the Dice Tower seal of approval. This is a game that I feel will live or die by this shaker as the underlying gameplay is solid but brings really nothing new to the table. I do worry that, I do worry that once the novelty of the shaker wears off, the game will be forgotten. But for right now, I'm still enjoying this game's gimmick. And that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching.